everybody. This is Justin Case of American Newscape, rejoining our friend, and some call our cousin Scott Dudley for American Consciousness. Hello, Scott. Welcome back. Hey, how you doing, Justin? I'm you know, hanging I'm in. Thinking, I'm, I'm thinking we got some marketing ideas here. So I, I think we should have like a T-shirt that says, "I used to be unconscious, but now <laughs> yeah. I catch the show." <laughs> no, mine will say, I used to be unconscious, but now I recognize my unconsciousness. <laughs> right. And I, I used to be unconscious, and then I heard a funny noise, and I turned it up. Exactly. That's good, too. Hey, got a trend. Yeah. Okay. All right, Scott. Are you ready for this? Are we really going to talk I, about gambling? We are, but we're going to take gambling wisdom, if you will and take it and apply it to real life and then let people decide who they are because ultimately we're all gambling every everything that we do has probability of outcome odds you know you you want to win the bet and so ultimately you make a decision about whether or not uh, you've got enough bankroll to, to invest and then whether or not your your odds of winning or not, so your odds of getting the outcome, and and this is really small stuff. So so like uh, the, the the I'm driving along the road, and a block ahead of me is a stoplight, and it's green. Do I speed up to catch the green? Do I stay the same uh, speed? Like well, it's going to happen or it's not. Do I just go ahead and take my foot off the gas because I anticipate it's going to not turn green? You know, so I'm, I'm basically betting on the, the economic resources of the car. You know, I'm trying to save some gas or whatever. And and I'm making an odds-related choice on whether or not I'm going to do We We do this with everything we do. Absolutely. That's why it's kind of fun to break it down and think about it. Oh, absolutely. With our diets, with our behavior, with our... Uh circle of influencers around us it all comes at a cost my mom bless her heart uh did everything perfect health-wise she went to the doctor every week she took the right vitamins she didn't smoke she didn't drink um and and because she was betting on longevity and when stuff happened to her and she ended up passing at 83 she was, her initial response was she was pissed. She was a very angry person for a couple of few days there because she placed all of her money on what she thought was a sure thing. So she thought that, that the, the odds were very good that if she did everything the right way, that she would be blessed with a, a life longer than her, her parents who both lived until about 90. And her parents, you know, smoke and drank and and led unrighteous lifestyles oh and God. and so she figured if she did it all right that that she was going to get like this bonus extra life or whatever and it didn't happen and and i think that that's that's what makes stuff like this interesting so so i, I want to start with probabilities so basically you're some things that you're betting on probably are never going to come true 50 to one odds you know and so you could you could go ahead and throw your rent money at 50 to one odds and if you hit on that thing you're going to be really you're going to be really happy you're probably going to waste all that money gambling because you think now you're like immortal or immune and and you're going to win everything probably not the case but 50 to 1 is like it's never going to come in. It's it's really, really remotely possible. You know, so, so, but then there's 50 to 1 to 20 to 1. That's like improbable, right? It's like not likely at all. And we bet lots of times on things that aren't likely to happen or come true or work out in our favor. And we're more than willing to kind of throw money at that thing because we have uh, hope, faith, charity. We have something, and and so we're ready to throw that at. So, but but that that you know, fifty to twenty to one stuff is like not very likely. 
Improbable. Improbable is probably my favorite. I'll be honest. Uh, the 20 to 1 to 10 to 1. And I like improbable because if you're really up on your analysis, if you're really paying attention to stuff, sometimes you can find angles. Sometimes you can find uh, insight. And that insight then allows you to get a pretty good payback on a, on a relatively small investment. And so I, I, I'll be honest, I spend a lot of time hanging out in the improbable zone. <laughs> You already knew this, right, Justin? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, makes life interesting, doesn't it, Scott? You know, it does. And, and, but, and I think one of the, the, the good medicine, the, the, the good vibe things of being in the improbable zone is to realize it's improbable. To, to say, that's improbable. I'm going to bet some time, bet some effort, bet 10 push-ups every day, bet, bet something on this, knowing that it's probably not going to happen and not being upset when it doesn't happen and not being like, like feeling cheated or whatever. So that's, that's improbable, I th but unlikely 10 to one to five to one. And you think about like something like five to one and you're thinking, well, that's like almost a favorite. That's like something that's likely to happen. But then you do the math. Five to one. Twenty percent of the time, it's going to be true. Right. The other eighty percent of the time, it's not going to happen. So even something that's five to one, which sounds like you know, like, like you say, pretty good odds, uh, unless you're you've got some analysis behind this thing that leads you to believe that that five to one is undervalued then ultimately five to one is still most likely 80 percent likely not to happen and so so you, you got to think about it that way more likely things are, are basically the five to one to say one to one now i know we're, we're going to step away from the gambling analogy but players don't go to horse race tracks and bet favorites all day. Why might that, why might not be such a good idea? Well, that's uh, having known horse race owners and gone to the horse track a lot, the horse race owners generally sit with all the trainers and they know who is most probably gonna win the race. So if you're fortunate enough to sit close to them where you can overhear what they're talking about, you too can win the race. Not saying that it's fixed. But that's but that's good level analysis stuff because you stuff that information to help you make a decision that may not be available everywhere else. Right. Although who make the odds, they sit at that table too. So here's what happens with favorite stuff. So, you know, your horse race to win is two dollars. And your favorite's going to pay $2.40, $2.60, $3 to win. Well, if you bet favorites all day and favorites only win three out of four times, and it's more likely they're only going to win two out of four times, to be honest. At the end of the day, you're going to lose money. Because at the end of the day, your, your payoffs aren't high enough to justify the investment because the investment's not going to pay off every single time. Well, you, and so yeah, ultimately, you're, yeah, you, you're, you're factoring out the entertainment factor of horse racing. Uh, but those people that bet $2 on the long shot, I believe their entertainment value is higher for them. It's fulfilling for them to bet that long shot. Okay. Per perfect segue. So let's talk about this. So, Ultimately, throwing money at long odds, if you've got the bankroll, yeah. is, 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 can be entertaining, fun, or um, give you a sense of hope. I'll, I'll give you an example that's off, off the horse racing charts. Let's talk about, say, uh, stage four cancer. Right. Icky, right? Well, every single person who has had stage four cancer 
has prayed virtually every single person. Not only that, but everybody who loved them has prayed. Please, like, remove this from this person. Let this person not suffer. And we know that that tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people die every year from cancer. So praying to remove cancer is, is a crapshoot. It's a long, it's, it's, it's a very long odds bet. The odds are praying is not going to help your cancer, but it doesn't cost anything. Well, and, and that's it, really the key. Yeah, but it appeases that. Have you done everything you can? And a lot of people believe that that's all they can do. So if they don't invest that prayer, they'll feel they oh, failed absolutely. with that cancer. Yeah, my advocacy here is I'm praying because it doesn't cost anything. Right. You know, it's, it's, in, unless you're praying so hard that you forget to feed the cats and, and they get mad at you or something. You yeah. know, um, ultimately, prayer isn't, isn't going to delete your, isn't going to disrupt your bankroll. Which, you know, if it's not money, it's time, it's attention, it's loving other people, it's taking care of yourself. You know, that's your bankroll. Learning stuff, being a part of the world, um, getting Sanity. exercise. Sanity. Yeah, yeah, sanity is a, a real important bankroll factor. So, so prayer is, 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 even though it's an excruciatingly long odds move, it doesn't cost anything. And I think when you're talking about long odds moves, that's an important factor to consider. What is this costing? So you don't roll your rent money on a 50 to one shot. Well, you and know, go, I, I agree with you, Scott, but you know, what just keeps pounding in my brain is one of the biggest uh, risks that we all take is birth control because none of them are foolproof. None of them. And uh, that can alter people's lives, but they still are constantly willing to take that risk. You know, that's a cost reward type of thing. And, uh, you know, then they, they seem betrayed. So we're talking about things that are very, very high odds. So very good odds, right? right. So 99 point some percent of the time, if you're using the birth control pill let's just pick one right uh you're probably not and you take it every day like you're supposed to mm -hmm. 99 point some odd percent of the time it's gonna work just right. like 99 point some odd percent of the time when i get in the car to drive to the grocery store i'm not gonna get hit by a car absolutely. i'm not gonna get into an accident absolutely so these are extremely odd but as you suggest the bankroll on 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 birth control yeah so when, when you're having sex, that's a large bet. Right. Large reward, too. if you too, have so. a child, then you've got, well, you've got some decisions to make either way. And and those decisions are going to have consequences. Absolutely. No matter what they are. And uh, um, it, it's just kind of like the, I remember coming into, you know, getting past adolescence and hearing about the rhythm method. And even I was <laughs> skeptical. But people do it all the time. Right. Well, and, and if you're if you're really looking at bad odds, rhythm methods probably your best choice in, in terms of sexual intimacy. <laughs> yeah. That that one's not that one winning horse nine times out of ten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Better living through chemistry. Well hey Scott, while we're here, while I've digressed into a sexual topic which I should have never brought up. No, let's uh, just do this. <laughs> <laughs> how how are the people at the dog park and what what did they add to this? What did they, how I know they prefaced you. I haven't been prefaced. So what did they bring to this conversation? So the dog park was interesting again because people have such an individual way of looking at this. And one of the people I talked to this morning uh, bought himself a pretty cool motorcycle in his early twenties. Yeah, and and it's a motorcycle that he can take off road, and so he goes off road and, and drives on these crazy trails, like like very exciting dopamine. Let's do this 
uh, trails. And so he talked about his coming to terms with the bet. So he's betting that, that he'll be able to survive this, that, or he'll be able to do this without some sort of catastrophic injury. And it took him a few years. He was talking about his process where he had to kind of catch up to that reality and accept it and be a part of it. And then in doing so, he's kind of come to peace with it. And, and that was kind of an interesting take on, on you know, I'm betting a lot. And, and it's kind of a risky bet, but but I've already accepted if I lose that bet, I'm going to live with it. Well, and, and that was an, that was an interesting take. You know, we we live. You and I live in an area where a lot of off roading goes on, and we all have friends that have been seriously injured by motorcycle accidents, off roading accidents. But I don't think we judge them. They were out there doing what they enjoyed. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. The only reason I'm not out there with them is, is my mom was a high school guidance counselor, and so she would take me to graduation every year, and show me the kid in the wheelchair, and say, "This is what motorcycles do." <laughs> well, there's two things that I. She was so she was totally traumatized by it. You know, two things that I I've done and I refuse to do again. One was riding a motorcycle because I realized I was the, I was the impact dummy if there was an accident. And the other was riding in a VW Bug because as tall as I am, I could look down and see the road. I did not like that. That was There's just not enough meat on these bones. Yeah, I, I survived my bug years. And then I had, I had a motorcycle, and one evening I was driving at home. And I was driving down a two-lane road at 55 miles an hour. Everything was fine. And I looked down at the road, and I said, you know what? There ain't nothing between me and that road. And so I am 100% reliant on not only on, on, on the mechanics of the bike itself, but every other driver in every other situation, and if a deer runs out in front of me and everything else, to not be eating that road. Right. And to and to me and then and and that to me that was a that was a deal breaker. I was like, the bet is too high, and the odds aren't good enough that I'm just going to take a half a step back. And this I was in my crazy twenties. I mean, I was I was full throttle doing lots of unsafe things. And and but that thing right then I was like, okay, I, I took the bike home. I called up a friend. I ended up trading it for a, a, a front end for a '73 Barracuda and. and that was the story. Oh, cool. Well, you won that bet. Seventy-three Barracuda. That was that was a car. My first car. Oh wow, wow. But it was all crushed up, so it cost me eighty dollars. <laughs> yeah, but it didn't cost you ten thousand dollars to repair it. No, and and I can still walk. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. The good old days when you the good old days when you could repair a car yourself because a you could like fit your hands into the engine compartment, b you could like just get a Chilton's auto manual and and it was all you know fairly simple stuff. Right, um, you know, and I, my first car was a '69 Toronado, and when I got a little dent on the sidewall or on the wheel well, I took it to the the dealer and they said oh no this has to be fixed with lead that's why that car weighed so much that steel was so <laughs> strong <laughs> um and i couldn't believe it but you know that's how they made cars back then oh yeah yeah absolutely absolutely there were the, the curb weight on those cars was just incredible it was and the, they didn't break too well but <laughs> they were fun to drive <laughs> I, I, I had a, a 1968 Delmon 88, and its claim to fame was I could put a double bed in the trunk and there would still be room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Boy, you're taking me back now. Okay, let's get back to the dog park. And I do bleed for that motorcycle guy, but I won't mourn him if he does meet his fate. Kind of like the surfer. The surfer <laughs> riding those waves with the big white-bellied fish around. You know, he's, he, he's taking right. a chance. Well, and that's an you know, that's an interesting risk risk analysis, right? Because the odds are, if you're a surfer, even if you're surfing um, 
Avila Beach, which is really like right on the highway of the Great White Sharks. Uh, it only happens once every couple of years, and there are thousands and thousands of people surfing. And so ultimately, the risk of, of, of the bet is, is really high, right? If you get eaten by a shark, that's, that's not going to help. But the odds of it happening are excruciatingly low. And so you get to you get to be able to balance that, and and, and different people are going to make different steps. You know, I wouldn't be out there. No, I wouldn't. Either. I, I'll, I'll I'll sit on the beach and take pictures of surfers, and I'll go, "Wow, this is really cool." Just like the movie. <laughs> I, just like tattoos, I'll, I'll I'll sit there and look at people's tattoos and go, "This is awesome stuff, man! It's artwork. It's beautiful." And I don't have any tattoos. Uh, I'm 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 with you there, Scott. You know, I, I don't think I would pay money to endure a lot of pain <laughs> to have something put on me that when it's complete <laughs> finished, I wouldn't like. So some people actually like that pain, and it, it does good things to them, but not me. Yeah, well, I was never one for subjecting myself to pain. Out so we talked life. about probability, and and we talked a little bit about bankroll. But I think bankroll is a really key consideration when, when we're sitting back. And, and like I said, this is really individualized. There is no, at the end of the show, there is no, here's what you should do. We're all gambling. We're all gambling all the time. Bankroll is a big factor. So how much do you have relative to what you're risking? You know, I'll give you an example. We talked about the red light. And, and, and whether I was going to gun it or, or, or try to ease through or, or just slow down because, uh, it, because I, I don't feel like I'm going to be able to make it. When my dogs are in the car, the bankroll goes way up. So when my dogs are in the car, I drive ex very carefully. My job is to get those dogs safely to wherever we're going. And that becomes the bet. That becomes the, the, so now I'm not like, let's just roll the dice on this thing. You know, now I'm like, well, okay, I'm going to be careful because not only, I don't want to get to the red light and have to slam on the brakes and have the dogs go flying into the dashboard. You know, so, so ultimately there's an example of where the bankroll shifts. You know, where I don't have all this free money to just throw at something. I have to be a little bit more careful about about the chances that I'm taking, even if they're moderate chances, because I because I don't want to lose what I just put on the table. Well, yeah, and, you know, you and I we live in a uh, small enough community where everybody tends to know everybody, uh, and we know most of the law enforcement people. And we need to be careful to respect them and not. Uh, enhance our risks by taking advantage of the familiarity we may have with them. I've been called on the phone, my cell phone, by a police officer I knew who was following me, <laughs> asking me if I thought he should give me a ticket. Nice. That's kind of a rhetorical question. Huh? Yeah, exactly. But, uh, but <clears throat> you know, risk is everywhere, you know, financial, but the biggest one of all is love and affection you know it is because sometimes you have to really put it all on the table to get that that object of your desire you know you really love someone and you believe that that is that is well, well personally okay so personally i struggle with the concept of soulmate i'm like yeah not buying it but, but there are definitely wonderful people out there who make outstanding partners. And are they risk a healthy bet? They're, certainly they're worth that. You know, if, if you're looking at a lifetime of happiness or a lifetime of, of satisfying relationship, you know, the goods, the bads, the uglies, but at the end of the day, you're, you're like, this is where I want to be and this is what I want to do, then now you're going to have to, you're going to have to put some risk out there. Give, well, take a chance. Absolutely. And uh, there should be no shame in putting, taking that chance. 
and uh, if you put that you owe it to yourself to put that out there well and and there's there's the flip side right it's like i've got a relationship flirting with somebody else is a gamble yeah well um, yeah you know you have to have rules of engagement if you're in any relationship you must have established rules of engagement and it's between each couple and if you violate those even on a download that's a gamble and, yes. and it's probably a fairly risky gamble well absolutely but you you owe it to those you love and to yourself to establish those rules of engagement you can't turn around and say i didn't know <laughs> i didn't know that <laughs> sleeping with your sister would be a problem right <laughs> right maybe we should have had this discussion but i thought it was obvious yeah, i thought it was a family but no but it, it's uh you know love is fascinating and you know you can love your friends you know certainly different terms uh different gambles you're not gambling as much if you you know love your friends because you know they're not as uh, critical to your life a lot of them some of them are but uh, it's an honor to love them, and it's an honor for them to love you back. Love your neighbor. And, th and then, again, your behavior be gets, gets tempered by uh, the value of that relationship. And ultimately, when, if you step outside of those values, if you step outside of, the, of, the, of as you suggest, that kind of pre-agreed to, this is how we're going to be nice to each other, uh, you're taking a risk. You're taking a, you're, you're gambling. And ultimately, you know, if you lose your life partner over uh, careless flirting, you know, that, that, that's a big bankroll. <laughs> Literally sometimes, because you, you may be on the hook for some uh, alimony and child support and stuff. Right. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, there, there's too many stepping over the line situations uh, that we can all fall prey to without recognizing them, without recognizing that we were flirting or that our partner believes we were flirting. Oh, well, yeah, I, and you know, I'm, I'm helpless, I'm incorrigible, and, and my partner realizes this. <laughs> and, and, and all so women, the, all women want you, so... <laughs> So the older the woman and the less teeth she has, the more I'm just openly blowing it up because uh, because people deserve that type of attention. I agree. You know, a lot of people are going around not getting a lot of attention for whatever reason, and and they need to know that they're okay. And 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 for a while, my wife wasn't very uh, accepting of that. Right? She's like, why are you even talking to that person? And I'm like. <laughs> Just talking to them. I talk to everybody. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and you're right. You know, all people are beautiful in their own way, and, and, and there's a truth to that. And people need to feel, they need to feel beautiful. And uh, anything we do to, to help each other find that, that uh, inner peace, it's a good thing. Well, it's a bet. I'm, I'm betting that we are all interconnected and that person's joy or that person's feeling good about their lives and themselves is going to help not only the people immediately surrounding them, but it's actually going to get back to me. And so by me investing a little bit of, of you know, my bankroll in trying to make that person feel happy for a minute, holding the door for an old lady or whatever, you know, then, then then that to me is a, is, a, is a good bet. You know, even if the payoff isn't like as immediate or as, as obvious as a big pile of chips in the middle of the table, uh, the, the, the long-term payoffs may be better. And, and I'm not counting on some like after death reward situation, you know, like, you know, like I get a free pass at the gates or something, you know, that's a little bit of a stretch for me. No, I'll eulogize you, Scott, and it will be remarkable. I mean, everybody will be crying. They'll be sobbing. They'll say, I didn't know Scott that well. I said, well, that was your yeah. loss. You'll have, to, you'll have to find me first, Kurt. I've done some advanced <laughs> geological work on 
<laughs> were the most likely place that I bury myself that I could be agatized after several million years. And I've got a number of spots in the United States laid out. I just have to be able to be healthy enough to get to those spots and inter myself and well, not get caught. Well, yeah, I understand that. But it, it, what, once your spirit is so strong, we'll have to know that it's left. And, and that's what we'll eulogize. We'll eulogize your spirit so we don't need your bodily remains. I mean, don't get caught right. up on that. Well, you'll be like, well, I haven't seen Scott for like six years, and he's really, really late for the next show. What's right? He must be dead. Let's have a eulogy. And that, and that's a bet too. Even even eulogizing somebody, even that kindness, is a bet that there's a value there that's going to pay off. You know, Wait. if it were just a complete waste of time, or if it it was like the void, so it was like nothingness. Then, then that wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't, it doesn't cost a lot of bankroll to say nice, nice things about people. Well, but, you know, okay. I agree with you, Scott, but having grown up in a very German family, uh, when the elders would pass on, uh, it, generally at the wake, well, not necessarily, well, they wouldn't interrupt during the services, but generally at the wake, Let's just say Jim would say that John was a horse's ass. And then somebody would take offense to that. And the next thing you know, I was the idiot that had to break up the fight of the old men. The well, I was at the buffet table pounding <laughs> the German potato salad. Because that little bit of vinegar makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> it did. But see, they had vinegar running in their blood, so... Uh, no, it's just it's... so this. So for them, it was a little bit of a healing thing too, because they were able to kind of get stuff off their chests or or kind of right. come to terms with the final accounting. Yeah, how dare you lie about John? <laughs> he was a horse's <laughs> ass. <laughs> and see, that was the family I grew up in. My grandparents, if you said something nice about somebody that you know was not accurate, you would be immediately corrected, not hit or anything, but immediately corrected. In, there's there's a bet right there, right? It's right. like, I'm going to say a nice thing about this person, and I'm sitting in a room of people who know the truth. <laughs> yes, exactly. Damn the truth. <laughs> and we're we're in a society that doesn't embrace the right truth now. anymore. <laughs> okay, what else came from the dog park? You know, Which... uh, the other thing was was a person's acceptance of the value of the bet and the outcome of the bet. And so th this was a person who had uh, a potential job opportunity that, that they invested some time and energy and uh, caring and preparation and imagination and, and pre-planning. And, and, and those are all, that's part of your bankroll, right? I mean, you could be watching TV. And, and, and ultimately, it wasn't in the cards, uh, you know, for whatever reasons. And now they're accepting those reasons as, as being a fateful outcome, you know, in terms of, of this is what the universe wanted from me. And even though I invested in the bankroll, I'm okay with the result because uh, I trust the universe to know the outcome better than me sometimes. That was kind of an interesting perspective as well. It is, but what they were saying is in living life, and that's all they were doing. They were living life in researching and, and applying for that job. If they if it weren't for that, they'd have been living life in another manner. So that's a good I think they had a great attitude. You know, the watching T V and they don't watch live T V, so there it is. Well, yeah. The, same shit, new day. You know, it's it's a lot of at least you're living life. And and that person throughout Basically, what we're talking about is handling ambiguity. Like, how much ambiguity can you stand? And how willing are you to be engaged and invested and involved in something that has a less than certain outcome? And, and how do you keep your safety and how do you keep your perspective and balance when you open up your eyes and look down and you realize you're standing on a tightrope? Well, right, and it, 
wouldn't you wouldn't you contend that our wisdom and our experiences help us as we get older and we do become more a lot of people become more conservative oh absolutely because there's a your hormone levels <laughs> begin to reduce a little bit and that that puts the brakes on you being like completely off the hook but but i think b there's less I, i'll speak personally there is i i woke up one morning as a writer and I was sitting with, with the reality that in somewhere between a few thousand and, and, and maybe a million years, uh, there won't be any humans. That the earth will get destroyed eventually, that the sun will expand and then we'll get cinderized. And we don't have the capabilities to uh, expand ourselves beyond the solar system. In time, energy, technology, the whole thing. And so the odds right now of that happening are excruciatingly small. So let me just come to terms with the fact that everything that I create, everything that I put energy into, everything that I make happen uh, will eventually be completely erased. So I can leave footprints on the beach, but the next wave is gonna take the footprints away. And I woke up with that realization and, and it changed who I was. You know, it, it, it really got me a lot less uh, neurotic about trying to change the world, about trying to help people figure stuff out uh, or, or be supportive or even sustaining in that. And you're like, well, okay, what are you doing here, Scott? And I, I got an answer for that. You know, when I was four years old, I went on Romper Room. Do you remember Romper Room, the TV series? Did I you do guys have that in your... Well, I do because Mrs. Romper Room, who had a fascinating history, her husband taught at our high school. Nice. Ours was, in our neighborhood, it was Miss Romper Room. It was Miss Jeannie. And I was, I was writing her letters when I was four years old, you know, about her show. <laughs> And so, and so I was invited on the show several times. I became kind of a, like a, a semi-regular guest. Pat, you were a pet of the show. Well, I was, and because well, because I followed directions and I didn't disrupt when she was trying to do her thing. And you know, I, I was a fairly well-behaved four-year-old. But back then, in media, in my first days of media, I was. I believed everything. I believed I could change everything. I believed I could make everything uh, come together and work and be cohesive and be fair and be kind and be everything. And I believe that very, very much. And now, I, I, the opposite of believe that, that nothing that we say or do here is going to matter to the collective whole. We may have one person listening out there that says, you know what, I'm going to be more careful about how I lay my bets <laughs> because I realize I've been putting way too much in my bankroll and, and things that are not very likely to turn out. And then I run around and, and cry because I'm broke all the time. You know, so, so there's that. But collectively, the entirety won't change a bit. To me, suffering is, is a, a universal part of human and if you take away one element of suffering, sure enough, there'll be another element of suffering that will just take its place. And so there, there'll be like a universal constant of suffering. And so, so now I can engage in, in kind of change the world type of, of, of you know, efforts with the freedom and the liberation of knowing that even if it makes zero difference, I can be engaged and, and, and be open to it and, and, and basically not worry about the outcome because the outcome isn't going isn't gonna to matter. And that kind of makes it almost more fun or annoying. Well, you know, you face yourself in the mirror and, and you've come to a, 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 a great realization, but you can still have passion for your opinions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but I don't have to spend 14 hours a day writing books. <laughs> no, but if, if you find comfort in that, if that's part of your, if that's part of your joy in life, then you should, but you don't have no, to, you don't owe that to us. Right. But when it was, 
I, I was really feeling the, the compulsion that these words are going to do something somewhere that that is going to make a difference. And the minute I thought of, okay, well, I just left the footprint on the beach and the wave just took it away. I was like, okay, I can I can take a deep breath and relax, and 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 not be as compelled to try to you know, Van Gogh my way into human history. Well, you know, I I, I, can't, I was fortunate at a young age as a public speaker and speaking to an audience of six or seven hundred people that seemed to be enthralled with what I was saying and very congratulatory after the fact. But I, I quickly realized that if they were quizzed the next day on what I said, they would not remember any of it. It would have had no impact other than that moment. And I think we come to that realization as adults, you know, it's, it's, you know, that live in the moment to me is a very powerful gift you can give to others. It, it is. And it shouldn't take us aging to realize that the moments are limited. Well, right. And not guaranteed and not guaranteed and not guaranteed. Well, right. But it that's... seems that that's part of maturity. Well, yeah, maybe. I, I think some people are gifted with it younger than others, but yeah, but that, that's that's a message we should all be cognizant of sharing with others. You know, the, the people magic that believe is, the, the magic is here, the magic is now. Yeah, right. The people that believe the universe evolves around them really doesn't. <laughs> now that being said, I'm not going to bet the rent money on a fifty to one shot. <laughs> No, which that may make that may make a really exciting moment <laughs> until until that day, until we turn the far turn and, and come down the stretch last and then like stuff's getting turned off in my house well yeah but so, you're so the... there's always this kind of like like live for the moment but but don't let the moment be so engulfing that you over invest and the next moment comes and and you get nothing nada well I, I i with your meditation i would be concerned that you might get a false thought that could actually take you down the wrong path but maybe that's impossible okay so i would i at this point with bed betting i bet that the majority of my thoughts are inaccurate or incorrect and they're not my thoughts in terms of me creating them. They're just me kind of watching them scroll across the screen of my life. And and because of that detachment from my, my own thoughts, it's like, I didn't create this thought, it's just happening. Um, I am much more able to uh, enjoy the thought, go with the thought, play with the thought, rub the thought in people's salted wounds, you know. Uh, whatever I end up doing with that without really being attached to uh, its validity or its absolute correctness. That, and that being said, I'm also pretty analytic. So, you know, I, I, my dog went into, into heat at nine years old and I spent, you know, three hours looking up and studying dog estrus so that I could understand why my nine-year-old dog hadn't gone into dog paws or whatever it would be called. You know, so, so I do do a lot of, of work in terms of trying to kind of triangulate information and, and make sure that I'm, I'm not playing around injudiciously. Wow, that's a good word. Injudiciously. I can't even say it, it's so good. Well, it's, it's saying it and doing it, it's like, <laughs> there's a big, there's a fairly big gap there. Well, and you know what's funny? What, what sparked a thought of my on my hamster on the wheel in my head was uh, we none of us have any original thoughts. You know, whatever thought we want to own has been thought millions of times before we had that. Thought. That was that was my experience as a writer, and and I handled it two different ways. First of all, I I stopped really digging into experts on my topic because I knew that ultimately whatever popped into my head had already popped into theirs. And, and, and so basically I could say an opinion and save myself the trouble of having to look up a citation. 
you know, and say, well, yeah, but this person kind of thought of this first. Um, that, that was kind of liberating in a way, but it was also like, I can trust my own process, which is a bet to stay sane, to stay healthy, to stay connected in relationships, to, you know, stay out of jail. Um, and, and that was the, that was the bet I ended up taking was that I wasn't going to get that much more enriched by following other people's processes as much as I was going to be able to get enriched by following my own processes. Well, yeah, and it's all, <clears throat> you know, how fragile are our sanities and uh, how, w what can we keep from doing to risk them? Um, I never even stopped to think about it, but I never stopped to think about what would drive me over the edge. So I, I, I've got a, a, an angle on that. You've got consensual reality and you've got non-consensual reality. And it's not an either or. So you and I are both doing this uh, interview right now. And we've got a lot of overlap mm -hmm. in terms of what we think is real. You know, we've been doing it this much time. This is what we've talked about. This is what it looks like. And, and yet you've got a unique perspective from your side of the screen. And I've got a unique perspective from my side of the screen. So we don't, we're not completely consensual. Right. But there's a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. That overlap is our safety factor. So if you look at people like with psych psychotic disorders, and they believe that uh, the signals are coming through the air from uh, gods who lived millions of years ago, telling them that certain things and people and events are going to happen and are happening. And they're the only person in the world who's picking this up, wow. which of course makes them special, which is also problematic. That's, that's non-consensual reality. And it is a lonely place because, because they're not going to get any validation from, from much of the world. Yeah. You know what? I was thinking that same thing. No, you weren't thinking that same thing. So now I'm just going to say that you're, you're off your you know, rocker. And that is a, a, to be pushed out into that nobody believes what you believe uh, spot and, and, and to have to face the fact that you're alone in this world with this head full of thoughts that you believe are true, but nobody else can understand. That, that's a really hard, that, that's why it's so hard to be, have a psychotic disorder. Because, and, and that's why people tend to, that's why people tend to sheeple. That's why people tend to congregate around uh, ideologies because there's there's safety in numbers and so ultimately and, and and people use that to their advantage there's a lot of psyops with that because if i can tap into your fear or if i can tap in if i can give you enough information to guide your emotional response and let you know that there's a group of people who feel just like you then your your natural safety response is to to congregate is to go for the consensual reality rather than being an outlier. You know, nobody wants to be on the edge of the school of fish. That's the one that gets eaten. Nobody wants to be on the edge of the school of sheep. That's the one that gets eaten. So we all kind of want to get into the, the, the group and, and be safe that way. And, and, and that creates an interesting situation. If you want to tease a topic, we could talk about that next week and we could go all the way in. Well, we can because I've always kind of lived as the tip of the spear. And found comfort in that, right? But 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 um, it, who's holding the spear, right? I mean, who, who who's aiming the spear? Spear doesn't aim itself. The tip of the spear just goes where it's thrown. And 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 to me, that's where where I I begin to question and re-question and double question. And and I know I tend not to believe anybody. To be fair. <laughs> Well, no, but you're because, jelly be right. <laughs> right? Well, because anybody who puts out information is is putting out information designed to uh, make you think or feel or act in a certain way. And and ultimately that would be based on their priorities, not yours. Well, do you think And that's doing... my bet. And that's a that's a bet that I make. So I spend a lot of time uh, throwing dirt at everybody because because 
because I, I feel their push. I feel their, their, come over here, you'll be safe in this group of people. And I'm like, yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah, but you don't believe we're doing that. We don't have no. an ulterior motive in what we're okay. doing. And that's, okay, so that's, let's break a wall here. Let's go fourth wall. I think that's what's really the value of American consciousness is that, that you and I, and we're really diverse people. Yes. We're not pushing people into a certain spot. We're not saying this is how you need to manage this. Otherwise, you won't be safe or you won't be loved or you won't be whatever. Um, we're saying think it through and make your own choices. Yeah, because we don't, have, thinking, we don't have those answers. We don't have those answers but, but, for us. But we're willing to admit it. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. When, when, when somebody asks somebody, like, what would you do to do something better? Or have you ever made a mistake? Or, and, and they don't have like a really long list. <laughs> I'm like, <Right>. you know, <laughs> my trust in you is just zero at this point. No, I want the meds that they're on. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. It's, it's funny. I was lucky enough to get a, a rescue dog and the rescue dog trusts nothing and no one. And, and, and I see so much of myself in the dog. It's like dogs and people that, you know, your owner and your, your dog are going to end up acting alike. And, and so uh, every time she, she demonstrates her healthy mistrust of, of an environment or a situation, I'm like, yeah, girl, you go. Good girl. Yeah, good girl. Smart. Smart like owner. Smart like master. And, and then you look at the dogs who trust the world and nothing bad ever happens to them. And then you're like, well, it's kind of interesting, too. Well, it's pretty, you know. Pets certainly take on the personas of the human beings that are around. That's why I like getting mine after they're all grown up and developed, because then it's like, then we have to negotiate. It's like I, I didn't get to, I didn't get to pour it all into them as puppies, and and now we get to like say, well, that's the way you see the world. That's interesting. Yeah, but you came out of the industry of behavioral response. I mean, poor Pavlov's dog. I, I, I've had, I, I've done rescue dogs my whole life. So that's, that's my spot in the world. That's cool, Scott. And that's a good moniker. And I will certainly bring that up during your eulogy. And that's what I want <laughs> you to take away from this. You find comfort in no matter where you are, you will become immortal in what I say about you. No, I, oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. And I appreciate the fact that, that acknowledging that there is comfort in every moment. And it's just a matter of being aware of that and being alert to that and, and putting your bet that that's the way life is. You know, I bet there's some comfort here somewhere. And I am optimistic that if I stay attentive to that and I look for that, maybe I even let it come out of me. Then then it's, it's going to be there and it's going to happen. That's a bet. Well, it is. And <clears throat> I think you and I try and live our lives that way, but occasionally we fall off that pedestal so to speak and then we but we're more having done that we're more adept at getting back there yeah and 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 more adept at, at allowing our my moments of inner stupidity <laughs> you <laughs> to, can say our <laughs> <laughs> to just come to light and go through you know it's it's like it's okay you're gonna be stupid sometimes that's part of being human you know that's that's part of the limited operating system of being human is is you're gonna you know trip up over your own internal processes and and the stuff in your environment and and it's gonna get goofy but, you know that's one of the advantages of living around dogs and cats you see uh, sometimes how sympathetic they can be to how compli over complicated humans are right they'll, they'll just look at you like really <laughs> is, that, is that really how you think about it? Yeah, is, is absolutely. This, is, is this the most important thing, watching football all day? You know, and it's like, <laughs> I thought it was. Yeah, it seemed, seemed good at the moment. All right, Scott, now that we're talking couple, about football. Okay, go ahead. Cu couple couple quick takes. Let's, let's, we've, got a, we've got a show. Let's, let's, let's do a couple quick takes on this. All right. And these are gambler takes, but they're good takes, and they're very, very true. And, and, and they're worth it. So remember, everything we're doing in life is a bet. And we're either betting on favorites, we're betting on things that we're almost sure are going to turn out okay, but they're not guaranteed. Right. 
or we're betting on things that have less probability of coming true, but they may have greater payoffs. And if we can afford to make those bets, that may be valuable to us as human beings. So, couple a couple of rules. The house always wins. Yep. Or as, 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 as it's said in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, it always ends in tears. And, and, and so it's important to remember that you're not going to beat the house. So whatever bets you make in life, eventually you're going to cash in and, and cash out and, and that'll be it. You know, so, so, you're, it, so there's not this kind of permanency that you're gambling with. The next wave is going to take your footprint away. That's fine. The house always wins. The second one is this. And this is, I, I grew up with gamblers. I grew up with people who, it was before the, before the time we said problem gambler. These guys are probably problem gamblers. Beloved family members, but, but they, they certainly like their gambling. And, but, but this is their, their rule. If you can't afford to throw the money on the ground and walk away from it, don't bet it. Absolutely. That's the rule. That's the rule. So, you, you know, you spend several hundred dollars on a trip to Disneyland. You can spend several hundred dollars betting that if you join a gym and work out all the time, that you're going to have some sort of happier, healthier body. And you're just as likely to go to the gym and blow out a disc in your back. You know, it's, it's, you don't really know outcomes ahead of time. So ultimately make sure that when you're looking at your bankroll, that you're not leaving yourself short or your other responsibilities short. You know, you've got people that care for you, that you care for. You've got animals, maybe you've got a career, you've got your health, you've got all these other aspects of yourself. Be careful that you're not shoving all of your chips that you need for something else onto the table on some bet that, that looks really good on paper, but the house always wins. Right. Right. That instantaneous gratification you may get may not be worth the risk. The, the dopamine rush of watching your 50 to one shot lead coming into lead coming into the home stretch and you're already spending the money in your head. <laughs> and then that two to one shot comes out of nowhere. <laughs> and just walks by them like they're standing still. Yeah, I don't want to say I spent too much time at the horse track, but I do remember once that a woman about 70 years old, when the jockeys came back around after the race and were milling in front of the crowd, she went underneath the rail and went out there and started hitting one of the jockeys <laughs> with her parasol, exclaiming that he was a cheating x x x x x x x x x and everybody in the stands were we aghast no we applauded her as our hero you know it's there are so many variables in any bet right and i think that that's the other consideration is you know we're talking about horse racing well you know if a horse fly lands on your horse right when the gate opens that moment of of the horse going ouch is enough to cost the horse to race you know, the, the shadow coming across the, the fence while, while the horse is running on the track. Uh, a, a little sidestep, uh, a, a little slippery spot, uh, a jockey who has other priorities, yes. a trainer who wants to set up a horse to win at a bigger price next week or two, in two weeks. And, then, and so they say, hey, don't really push hard today because right now you're getting three to one. Next week you're going to get 12 to one. You know, that there, life is like that, and, and life has a lot of, of variables that are, are not only natural, but some that are also being manipulated. And that's an important thing to remember when you're, you're, when you're remembering that everything I do is a little bit of a bet. Oh, absolutely. All right, Scott, why don't we leave it there and, and send our regards to everybody at the dog park, and I hope they're here watching this tribute to them. You know what, I've, I've found their feedback so useful in terms of, of just kind of trying to figure out what people might think about when we throw something onto the table like this. Well, it's, it's certainly uh, it's, uh, helpful to us and hopefully it's helpful to them too. 
They're they're uh, eager to start receiving their royalty checks. I, I promise them oh. any day now. <laughs> Tell them uh, as we are reaping in the huge profits that we intend to share those profits with them. The merchandise. I used to be unconscious. Now I listen to the show. <laughs> now I listen to the show. <laughs> I've lost another hour. <laughs> All right, everybody. This has been Justin Case and Scott bringing you American Consciousness. I hope you had a few laughs and may have learned something from this. Thanks for joining us. Remember, additional information and links providing this video is read more. Today is the day to subscribe to this channel. Please learn more about Scott Dudley when time permits.